All right, welcome to video number three. So we've done the overview of the H2B visa program. We talked about the prevailing wage in video number two. We made a cup of tea, right? So you're, you're with me here, all right? Now, uh, uh, just as a reminder, if you want even more information on the carousel below this video and in the links of the video description, uh, you can see the H2B visa 2024-2025 ultimate guide put out by Frontier Tech Law. You should download it, it's free. Okay, and uh, if you want a consultation, go to frontiertech.com slash consultation. I'm happy to talk to you about your H2B visa needs. Now, why might you want to talk to me? Well, this is a great video um, to, to, to learn about why the H2B visa program is actually uh, a, a full year program. Okay, it has this reputation of being a program that you file for twice per year for an April 1st start date or an October 1st start date. The government's fiscal year runs from June to June. So actually, the first half of the cycle is for an October 1 start date. What we're entering now is the fiscal year 2024-2025 cycle. On July 1st through July 3rd, uh, a whole bunch of attorneys, agents, employers will be filing their applications with an October 1 start date, and they'll be entering something called the lottery, which we're gonna talk about on this video. And what we just got through, I'm filming this in May 2024, was the cycle for uh, H-2B visas starting on April 1st, which is by far the biggest and the most well-known of the H-2B visa cycles. But in fact, the H-2B visa process is a full year process and you can file the ETA 9142 all throughout the year. There are five periods you can ask for workers. Okay? You can ask for workers with an April 1st start date, you can ask for workers with a May 15th start date, just a May 15th start date and just an April 1st start date, meaning you can't really ask for workers for an April 2nd start date, okay? You can then ask for workers for May 15th to September 30th start date as separate from May workers with just a May 15th start date for reasons I'll get into in a minute. So that's three periods. The fourth period is you can ask for workers with an October 1st start date to around a November 15th start date for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. And then you can ask for workers with about a February 1st start date to a February 15th start date, okay? Each of those periods has a unique type of worker available. And uh, each of those periods has a, 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 a kind of a unique filing procedure, but that has a commonality with every other filing procedure that we're gonna talk about, particularly as concerns the statement of need. What they all have in common is that whatever start date you choose, you're going to need the Department of Labor to certify you as an employer with that particular start date. And only when the Department of Labor certifies you are you going to be able to file with USCIS, so U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, to get an H-2B visa number. Furthermore, if the DOL does certify you, in most cases you're going to get something now as of 2022 called a registration number that's going to be your proof for the next three years that you have a valid seasonal or peak load need for the position that you're asking for so that you don't have to prove it every year, which is a marked improvement from previous years. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. But how do you get certified? I mean, like, I know, I talked about it in the overview. You file an ETA 9142, and then the government says you, you either have peak load need or seasonal need, a one-time need, intermittent need, or you don't. But like, how does it actually work? Let's talk about that, all right? Again, in the previous video, we said you have to have a prevailing wage for this step, okay? So you have to have a prevailing wage for this step. And the other thing that you have to have for this step is you have to have been registered with your state as an employer, whether you're a sole proprietor, LLC, c Corp, whatever state your area of intended work is in, you have to be registered with that state because that's where you're gonna be posting your job orders, which we're gonna talk about. You have to have evidence backing up your need if you don't have a registration number, or you have to have a registration number when you still wanna have some evidence for the USCIS step, but we don't have to talk about that now. And what you're going to do is 90 days from your target start date. So let's say, let's say we're talking about April 1st. You're gonna file on January 1st for an April 1st start date, your ETA 9142. And your prevailing wage is gonna be in the system, so you're gonna match up your application with that prevailing wage. You're going to put in your signed Appendix B. 
you're going to put in your evidence and uh, you're going to put in the job order that you're simultaneously posting on the SWA site, which we'll talk about, and you're going to put in your statement of need, which explains why you have a qualifying need as a U.S. employer for an H-2B worker. And your choices are seasonal, peak load, intermittent, or one time. Now, let's talk about what it takes to, to, to have all that, okay? So what it takes in terms of the SWA is that you need to be like a truly registered employer. You can't just say, hey, I'm Damien from Connecticut. I'm going to be employing some people. In most cases, you have to have your sole prop has, in all cases, your sole proprietorship even has to have an EIN. So you have to have an employment identification number from the IRS, the federal agency. You then have to register with the state workforce agency for your state, which is run by the Department of Labor. And usually you have to get an unemployment insurance number, which takes time. And you have to register on the jobs portal where you're going to be posting jobs. Every state has different requirements for this piece. So you're going to have to get familiar with your state's particular requirements. Fair warning, if you're in California, this bit is quite difficult. There are other difficult states. North Carolina is a bit complicated. They have a whole process that you have to go through. There are easier states. New Hampshire apparently doesn't care what you do as long as you put a job up, okay? But you're gonna have to be familiar with your state and you're gonna have to give yourself several weeks to do this. So you can't just start doing it as soon as you file the ETA 9142. And once you register with SWA, you're gonna have to create a job order on one of these websites that they have and you're gonna have to have a copy of that for this application. You're going to need to sign the Appendix B. The Appendix B gives you 26 items you need to be familiar with as an employer, which constitute your responsibilities and duties as an employer towards the program and towards your H-2B employees. Okay. And again, you're going to need some evidence. Usually you might need four quarters of taxes. You might need payroll documentation. You might need uh, revenue documentation put together in a format that the Department of Labor likes to see, which is month by month revenues, month by month payrolls for the kind of permanent and seasonal employees in the category you're filing for. You need all that on hand. And the centerpiece of all of this is your statement of need. Now you get 4,000 ca ca characters within the page of the 91424. form. If you're a landscaping business, you know, you're going to be able to do this in, in, a, in, a, in a few hundred characters, most likely. Hey, I'm a landscaper in Minnesota. It's cold uh, and the ground is frozen and I don't do any business from October to January, February, uh, except for like holiday lighting. And what I need is landscapers to get me from, you know, April to October or to, you know, get me from March to October, whatever the case may be. But if you have a, a, a more unique business or you're applying for a position that hasn't traditionally been part of the program, but has lately become part of it, like a caregiver, a nanny, uh, I've done a driving instructor, right, uh, before, then you're going to need to explain a little more and you have the option to attach a statement of need uh, into your application, okay? Each category, each occupation is going to have common questions that come up from the Department of Labor. And if you know these ahead of time, then you're ahead of the game because you can make sure you're answering those questions within the body of that statement of need. For me, if I can fit the statement of need within the body, I do so because I find that, number one, if, if I can concisely get it in, it leads to fewer notices of efficiency. Uh, but if I can't, or I know if it's a special category, like a nanny or a caregiver uh, or a welder, then I usually attach a statement of need. What happens is that you have to file this within a particular filing period, in most cases. For an April 1 start date, you get three days during which you file it. For an October 1 start date, you get three days. And then all the applications that are filed during that period get put into a lottery. Okay. And they get put, put into a lottery because each fiscal half gets a certain number of what are called new workers. There's 33,000 new workers that are officially granted, uh, new worker visas that are officially granted the first half of the fiscal year and 33,000 for the second. These are given out in order of priority uh, and that priority is given out through a lottery. So all applications filed in the first three days, January 1 to January 3 or July 1 to January to July 3 are put into a lottery. And then the first 33,000 are put into group A, first 33,000 visa requests, the next 20,000 to group B, next 20,000 group C, next 20,000 group D and so on and so forth. For April 1, we usually go through to group G. For July 1, last year is the first time that we had a second group, Group B, which is a surprise, and I anticipate that the program is going to grow this July 1st, 1st even more, so I anticipate getting a Group B 
uh, getting Group B assignments again in this July 1st. Group A is processed first. If there's visas left over, Group B is processed and so on and so forth. The next thing that happens is uh, first action. So first action means you either get a notice of acceptance, everything in your application is good, or you get notices of deficiency. A deficiency can be that something hasn't been filed right, maybe a job order isn't filed correctly, maybe the job description is too vague, maybe the job description has too much experience required, uh, maybe the Appendix B isn't attached, maybe you mentioned you're using a recruiter but you didn't attach Appendix D, uh, maybe you didn't put a worksite address incorrectly. Maybe you put in Afghanistan instead of the United States for your headquarters address. Uh, maybe you're requesting three kinds of workers on a one kind of worker application. Uh, maybe your statement of need is too vague. Maybe you've, you're asking for seasonal workers, but you have a peak load need. Maybe you're asking for one-time occurrence, but you don't know what that is. You really need seasonal workers. Uh, there can be a whole host of reasons. At any rate, you get issued a notice of deficiency instead of a notice of acceptance, and you get 10 business days to respond to it. It's in your interest to respond ASAP because it is a race to get those 33,000 new workers. If you're applying not for an April 1st start date, for a May 15th start date, then there still might be a lottery, though there ha traditionally hasn't been. Um, and you're just waiting for a first action. If you're applying for, uh, and same thing holds for if you're applying for workers from a February 1st or a February 15th start date, or if you're applying for workers from a May 15th or May 15th to September 30th start date. I know you're confused. It's okay. It all sounds like a foreign language. I'm just trying to tell you what it's like. Okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to give you the naked truth. Okay, I know that's confusing. But the point is, you get the statement of need in. By the way, the guide has some examples of what statements of need look like. Okay, so you should follow along. It's a study session. I'm just trying to give you the, the real stuff here. Okay, this is the real information. Once your, no, once your first action comes back, uh, let's say it's a notice of acceptance or your notice of deficiency comes back, you respond to get a notice of acceptance, you go to recruiting. It's 15 business days of recruiting. Business days are defined according to when your business is open. So if you have a business that works seven days a week, then you're, you can count all seven days for recruiting. If you have a business that's only open five days a week, like a retail store closed on Saturdays and Sundays, then you can only count the days that you're open, so typically Monday through Friday. If you have a nanny or a caregiver, typically you can count all seven days because your caregiver and nanny need to be there for the kids all seven days, okay? For example, after 15 days, day one is the day after the notice of acceptance. On day 16, you turn in a recruitment report. That recruitment report says all the U.S. workers that might have applied for your position, if you offered them a job, if you didn't, why not, okay? A U.S. worker is not just a U.S. citizen, not just a legal permanent resident. It's anybody with a work permit with which they can work inside of the United States. So somebody might have... TPS, right? Temporary Protected Status. They're from Guatemala. They're applying to your job. They're considered a U.S. worker. You have to consider them for the position, okay? Because the Department of Labor is all about protecting U.S. legal U.S. workers, okay? You put in the recruitment report. Uh, if uh, the Department of Labor certifies your position, you get a certification, and now you're ready to apply to the U.S. CIS. How long does this take? Well, if you apply the first time and you have to put in a full statement of need, um, it, 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 can take, uh, it, it can take about, let's say, two weeks if you're in Group A from application to approval. Okay, that's typically the fastest. For registration numbers, if you're a, uh, a worker that has, if you're an employer that's had a registration number from a past cycle, uh, it can be very quick as long as everything else is lined up. Okay, and we'll talk about registration numbers in a different video. If you're in a different group, if you're a Group B, Group C, Group D, Group B, Group F, Group G, you might not begin processing for the April 1st cycle until late January, February, March, April, and you should be in touch with somebody that understands where your application is at, okay? But certainly if you're in the later groups, you can expect to wait months to hear back on an application. Now, what's interesting is if you go on the flag.dol.gov website and you go under resources, you can check to see processing times for the H2B and you can see which groups are being processed when. Okay, that's a great resource. So flag.dol.gov, hit the resources tab and you can go under there. This 9142 process, um, it, I don't think that it even sounds simple when I tell it to you, but what it requires is understanding, you know, what kind of language needs to be in your application for that statement of need. It requires understanding that uh, what the DOL officers are looking for. And it requires knowing that your prevailing wage actually fits within the confines of the H2B program before you even apply. So you should go back to that 9141 prevailing wage video to see what I'm talking about there. Um, needless to say, if you do get the certification, you will, you're at a good place. 
In most cases, if you're seasonal or peak load or even intermittent need, you'll get a registration number that says for the next three years, you don't have to go through that statement of need process again. You can just reapply with a new application, pop in your registration number. And you get that certification, and now you can actually apply at USCIS. And that process is uh, the first one, as we'll talk about in the next video, where you're going to be required to actually pay money to put in something called the I-129 application. The fees for that now are huge. Um, you're going to have to know whether you're a small employer, whether you're a big employer. And in most cases, you're going to have to present the same evidence that you presented to the DOL to the USCIS. Although if you have a registration number, um, you know, we can talk about how that changes. But you're two thirds of the way through the process. OK, and so you should feel good about that. Um, if you have questions about what I've talked about here, and I'm sure you will, check out that H2B visa 2024-2025 guide. Um, I try to include an FAQ. I try to include an FAQ in there that's comprehensive. And along with this video, that should kind of give you a good idea of timeline and the statement of need, along with some statement of need examples that you can check out with it. Okay, so thanks so much for uh, joining me here on video three. And uh, as I uh, move on now, we're going to go check out what the USCIS process is like. Thanks so much.